We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight's question comes from tabletop bellhop patron Dr. Donna B, better known by the folk in the lobby and our Discord as Axanarian or Ax the Paladin. Now she asks, you've made me aware that you can save some tabletop games. Mm -hmm. The game provides a way to save the game state for resumption later. That's something that we're familiar with from video games, but is uncommon in other kinds of games. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder about other video game mechanics or video game experiences that could be incorporated after a fashion in board games. So my question is, if you could take anything you find particularly enjoyable or useful in video games and somehow translate it to board games, what would it be? This could be a kind of experience that you find pleasurable or a mechanic or functionality that would be interesting to bring to board games. Well, thanks for the great question, Donna. And of course, thanks for your long-term support of our show. Greatly appreciated. Now, I think this is a fascinating question. I think this is going to be a fun one to talk about tonight because there's video games and, and tabletop games have taken an interesting, somewhat divergent, but sometimes overlapping path over the years uh, with concepts from one very much influencing the other. And I find it amazing nowadays is that sometimes you will have a video game based on a board game that's based on a video game that was based on a board game. And sometimes that goes full circle. Now, what a lot of people may not know and what I learned a lot from, from industry friends of mine and people I talked to on Facebook, as well as um, some of the documentaries that have been on, say, Netflix on the video game history, is that there's one good reason for this tabletop game and video game overlap is that people often transfer from tabletop gaming into video gaming. For years, people who worked in the tabletop industry were basically scooped up by video game companies, mostly in the position of writers, writers and designers and adventure builders. They weren't the people doing the code, but they were the ones writing the story. There's actually a lot of the old TSR alumni who went on from their basic position of writing role-playing games into writing games like um, Might and Magic. I can't remember the name of who it was offhand. Now, recently, I've seen there's a move the other way, where you have people from the video game world or even full on video game companies jumping into board gaming. And honestly, as time goes on, the line between the two types has become more and more blurred. Absolutely. Now, for many, this blurred line is a giant red flag. And we've had topics in the past that talk about the good and the bad that can come from mixing your analog and digital gaming together into one package. Now, while we don't share their opinion, many gamers still refuse to consider it a board game if it requires an app. Which I got to say is honestly somewhat ridiculous. While we do have some issues with apps for board games, especially obsolescence issues and things like the app stop working, the whole idea of blending the two honestly isn't a problem for me, and I find it kind of fascinating. It's the same people who also thought that Warhammer 3rd Edition was a board game, so wouldn't play it because it wasn't enough of a role-playing game. And to me, a, a dated old view. And you know what? It's sometimes old dogs should try to learn new tricks. Now, even with the line blurring and more things from video games showing up on tabletops, our tabletops and more tabletop things ending up in video games, there are still quite a few things that just off the top of my head, I would love to see more of. Yeah, certainly. Sharing ideas and concepts between things that are similar but different, has always been a way to help both sides grow. Mm. This is true for arts, sciences, and yes, even games. So we don't have these in like a numbered list or anything like that. I just want to talk about a few things that I would love to see more of on the tabletop. And I'm going to start with the one Donna already mentioned, because I think it's an important one that I would love to see more of, and that is the ability to save your game. Well, yes, there are a few games out there now that let you effectively save your game, they are few and far between. Now, Colonists is the first one that comes to mind. That was the first game that was like a big, heavy Euro game that literally had rules for how to save the game. Then there are also the Coded Chronicles games, most recently like the Scooby-Doo game we gave away, that has you a way to save between acts. Now, most campaign games technically are also saved in the fact that you stop after playing one scenario or adventure, put it away, note some things down, and then when you restart, you reset everything up. Now, the thing is, with absolutely every one of these, is they let you save at a very specific point, which tends to be 
once you've finished your scenario or adventure, finished a, a distinct part. The problem is I, I can't think of any games that you can literally put on pause at any point, put away and pick up later. Now, I wish you'd be able to do this. Like, sure, you can kind of do this. Like, we've done this. You take a picture with your, with, uh, with your phone of the board and, you know, we put everyone's cards. Like, put your hand in this bag. You put your hand in this bag. You put your hand in this bag. And, you know, the resources you won't go in the bag. Like, there's ways you can do it. Yes, you can do it, but I haven't seen anything like this actually integrated or suggested in game rules. I mean, those rich folks with enough space could just leave a game set up and walk away to consider it saving. But well, yes, I think restoring from a save point is really the mm -hmm. key here. And arguably, this concept, depending on how implemented, could even allow you to restore to earlier save points and thus evade death which could be handy in a co-op game. Yeah, no one else, like, I don't even know how it would work, but it'd be really cool to be playing, say, a game of Tapestry and be like, okay, you remember when this happened and everything kind of went sideways? How about we go back and try that again? But instead of me taking this thing that kind of broke the game, I go this way. And that is just something you can't do. Yep. Now... Another thing I want to talk about, and I think this is the, the biggest advantage board games currently have over tabletop games, is onboarding. Now, I remember back in the day, you bought a new video game, whether it was on floppy disk or even going back to the NES days, you used to get a pretty significantly thick manual that told you how to play. It would give you uh, how to insert the cartridge and physical stuff. But it would also give you the background story. It would tell you what this game's about and who the characters are. There's usually a how to use the controller and what the game is going to include and what you should expect. There's usually reference information, like the list of items you can pick up or the enemies you'll face and things like that. Now, looking at modern video games, when's the last time you bought a game that came with a rule book? Like even digital ones are rare, only really coming with the truly epic mass of games. Like when you get Civ Five. But even then, who downloads the PDF rulebook or even looks at it? And this is because video games have gotten much better at onboarding, which, like I said, tabletop games still struggle with. Now, there is one somewhat exception of that, and this is something that I think uh, possibly uh, video games have taken from board games. Uh, and I can my my first thought is the manual I got when I bought the physical copy of Diablo Two. Mm -hmm. Now, Diablo Two had combinations of things and 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 things that nowadays we would just be expected to figure out in game or go on a mm -hmm. wiki and check uh but they aren't given to you as a player because you're expected to take the time to find out how that thing works right. uh, and that's one thing that's changed dramatically over time is the amount of effort they expect from a game player um, mm -hmm. not that, not that old games didn't expect effort. I think of, uh, of your dad and some of the mapping he used to do. Well, yes, but, uh, there's, there are certain things where, where discovery has become more of an aspect in video games, uh, sure. which has helped shrink down the manuals. But even that the games that don't have that aspect tend to have the information. There's, there's a log book or something, or there's a reference or there's things you can bring up that will talk to you about how to get through it. Like, for example, I am started playing, um, drawing a blank on the name, The Witcher 2, but any of the Witcher games. And in the entire thing, you have this log and it's huge. And it's all written by the bard from the, if you've seen the Netflix series with uh, um, Dandelion, who they call Yaskir in the series for some reason, they made up a new name because they didn't want to call him Dandelion. But you can read it all in Dandelion's words. And I've got to say, it blows me away because it updates as you're playing. So like you can look up your quest and tells you what you're supposed to do. And it's all told third person and like, and you'll ignore an NPC and then you'll go check the log and it said, and, and um, uh, Geralt just walked by the beggar on the side of the road, totally ignoring him. And I'm like, oh my gosh. But like all the background information on the world, which would have been in a book is all in this journal. And yes, you can read it, but none of it's required to play. Yeah. Uh, now, Another, this is a tricky one because it will also, in order to do this in board games, more than likely add some material to the game. And mm -hmm. as we know, the more materials, 
the higher the cost. Now, that said, if implemented correctly, it may also reduce the cost of a, your rule book, which some people should probably spend more on anyway. Well, yes. <laughs> so it might be worth exploring this onboarding route uh, in order to find a balance of costs where if you can shave something out of the rule book for adding a couple of cards or something or some something into uh, other portions of the game. So one of the people experimenting with this right now is Friedman Fries, uh, the designer of Power Grid. He has a number of games out called the Fast Forward Games. And in Fast Forward Games, you don't have to read a rule book and you sit down and learn the game the second you open it with your friends and it's all done through cards. And you read the first card and it tells you how to set up, what to pass to people, what to do, and then eventually says stop and you play until you hit a, a, a next point and then you do the other thing. Another game doing this is, would be Shy Pluto for Space Base. Well, it kind of feels like a campaign. It's actually onboarding you, introducing each set of new card types to you one at a time. So there are people playing with this, but like I would love to see an onboarding experience for Tapestry because that is <laughs> yeah. a rough one. Absolutely. And, and in many ways, it may just be you expand the uh by expanding the rule book, you go through, look, set up the board in this way with these mm -hmm. cards out and take the deck and put these four cards out in its place. You're only going to use these four cards instead of, yeah. you know, this giant stack of cards. And you play through a round and nobody's going to win and nobody's going to lose. It's just going to be a game where you get to experiment and learn what moving, you know, what moving mm -hmm. up the explore track does or what moving along the technology track does or what passing and, and getting a new, uh, you know, putting income, in, yeah, in, the income, in, phase. income phase does. And all these little things that are so overwhelming to try and explain before first you play yeah. your first uh, round. So I got to say, Jamie did do a good thing with that because all of the action spots aren't explained in the rule book. They're on a separate handout that you can easily pass around. And nowhere does he tell you what each spot does except on there. So it's more kind of a, if you don't know what the icons mean, reference. So it does have something in there. So that's kind of nice. And I will admit some older games did this where they would walk you through a round of play. But that's like the exception. Now, a perfect example of that is Twilight Imper Twilight Struggle. Sorry, not the big space game. Mm -hmm. Twilight Struggle, the, the USSR versus the US and the Cold War. That game literally at the end walks you through an entire like era. Like you play the game through different ages, walks you through an entire age, play by play, explaining why people played these cards. Now, what it's actually doing is recreating a championship game that was played of it, explaining why the strategy of the players playing use certain cards but it gives you a full onboarding. Though I got to admit, most people probably skip it, but it's awesome that it's there. Absolutely. I, I think uh, Roger in the, show, in the uh, chat mentions Quad Heroes has a decent onboarding. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's another example of scenario-based games that have a tutorial yeah. scenario. Uh, and then I think one of the ones we've talked about a number of times is Aventuria. While they don't yes. uh, specifically have an onboarding in the box, they have... What they created was a something for demo teams to go out and mm -hmm. teach with. And if you get your hands on this, it is a fantastic way to introduce yes. new players to the game because it's an, an abbreviated, very, you know, set railroad style playthrough that gives you all the experience you need without overwhelming you with all the possibilities. Oh, totally agree. That is a good one. Uh, just correction, Yaskir, I guess, is his name in the actual books that were printed in Polish. So I'm not okay. sure where Dandelion came from, but in the video games, it's <laughs> Dandelion, um, which totally distracted me. Uh, so we were even talking about this the other day, about how some of this could be done better and how it would be awesome if you could get demo kits more often. If, if that was something readily available, if publishers produce some form of demo experience, right? So, so you're going to go to Origins. And I know this has happened because I've seen people do multiple demos and they always follow the same pattern, right? So you sit down and Stronghold Games is an example. I sit down to play Porto Negra at, at the game and the board's pre-set up. Some stuff's out, some stuff's. It's not the state the game would be in if you were just starting a game. And there is a set of cards in front of me and a set of cards in front of the demo person. And those were obviously handpicked. 
And the person's going to walk you through the game going, look, and I use this card and you have that counter card in your hand. So you do this and they show me a 10 minute version of play. I would love to start seeing that script, that that demo experience included in the game box. Or at the very least available on the website. So yeah, a look, PDF you know, version or whatever. people who are teachers, people who do go out and teach uh, teach publicly uh, game stores, you just go to the website and download a bunch of different teaching for these new games. And if they've got a demo, they're going to have a demo a day. They have the demo experience to provide for quick play. While you may also have other players out playing full games, mm -hmm. the, new, the new players who are just interested but not sure can go through an actual demo experience. I think that'd be fascinating. Overall, though, I just, and again, these are some suggestions. It's not like we have all the answers. And some of the stuff we're going to mention tonight, I don't even have an answer for. I just like to see it. I would just like to see the onboarding experience for tabletop games to be better. And that goes for RPGs and board games just as well. Like RPGs, there's beginner boxes. We just read talked about beginner boxes for D&D. You don't get those from board games. Where Where's the tapestry beginner box? Would that even be a product people would buy? <laughs> Probably not. But you could conceivably get a beginner's tuck box for tapestry, right? Or something, yeah. something, something tiny, oh. like, like just, just it doesn't need to be uh, anything significant. But just that little bit of of here's how you set it up, here's how you set up everyone's hands. Now play the game for a for a round. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next one. Let's have something else to add. Randomization. You can put any number of things on a table for a video game. You can put a million different gem types in your game. You can't put a million different gem cards in your tabletop game. The amount of data you can store in a program that you can somehow randomize in is huge. You've got multiple story options, lines of dialogue, physical, uh, not physical, sorry, um, diverging paths. All of that you're going to be able to do way better on a computer. Yeah, no, absolutely. And this is one thing where I think fantasy games and certain styles of sci-fi games have an advantage. Because yeah. if you have a map-based room, you've got an advantage. You can build uh, a, a set number of cards, and I'm sure there are statisticians out there who can tell, who can give you more. But with a, with, with a certain number of cards, the number of possible dungeons you can create right. becomes ridiculous. Um, but then you've got to use them, right? Like, so for an example, Gloomhaven has a random dungeon system. But it only uses two different rooms and it only gives you so many pre setups. And like we did about five of them and it was already feeling a little repetitive. So like it's it's and again, I think the biggest problem here is physical limitations cost. Like you just you could like every card is going to give you more powers, but you can't throw in a thousand of them. So I guess uh, Ryan's pointing out in the back the new Stellaris board game, which is being crowdfunded, has 3000 cards in the box. So that is one way to do it. Uh, well, and Stellaris is is uh, a whole different. I mean, the Stellaris is 4x Twilight Imperium uh, yeah. competition. But no, I mean, really, what I'm thinking is, and I and I think Gloomhaven, Gloomhaven does things very very right in some ways, but I don't think their concept of a random dungeon does necessarily. No. Um, whereas you know, if you just build square cards. Uh, that have either one entrance or two entrances or three entrances or four oh, geomorphs. Entrances. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, I'm looking. I'm thinking specifically of the the cards they use in the uh, video game that we both reviewed, Guild of Dungeoneering. Guild of Dungeoneering, where it's just basic dun uh, you know, basic dungeon mm -hmm. shapes or basic basic cave shapes, and and you know, with a a couple of different entrances and ed exits and a couple of different tunnels and the ability to rotate 90 degrees you know you've got thousands of dungeon comp yeah. whereas you had to fit things together very specifically in gloomhaven yeah you couldn't pick any two cards and put them together uh, as you found out because i think you even had yes. some, there was well, some no, mistakes there was a misprint right. there was a misprint on one of them so like other things with randomization of course too is 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 massive numbers and the math involved uh it just the thing that can fix this, and this is what publishers are doing, is using apps, right? You look at Mansions of Madness, first edition, with its fiddly cards you put over the board, 
And I don't know how many times we're going to say you can replay a certain scenario five times and always discover something new. With the app, you could play that same scenario 100 times and always find something new. And they can always add to it, which is something we'll kind of get into when I talk about a different topic later. But the fact that you you can integrate the apps will give you that variability. And I've got to say, that's what a lot of the Gloomhaven competitors seem to be leaning towards, is these app-based stories and app-based campaigns, because they can put all that in without having to put in thousands of different cards to read. Right. Uh, I think an example of what I'm thinking of, actually, that I just remembered about is the new Clank, Clank Catacombs, where you actually are building the dungeon rather than Mm -hmm. having a set board as we're used to in the uh, world of Clank. Here, interestingly enough, we're at CG Realm the other day and I found a Scythe product I didn't know existed. There is a variable board for Scythe. So you can buy this board for side that has various hex tiles that get shuffled and randomly placed on the board. So that is an example of a game doing it. And to be honest, Catan. Catan is an extremely popular game that has one of the most variable boards out there. Like not every game has most Euro games like boom, Catan. No, no, no. Just shuffle them up and put them down. Just make sure you actually put the number. Uh, yeah, that's the, right the problem. Spot. Some people, some people some randomize people it more than that. you're actually allowed to. Yes. <laughs> don't, don't, don't house rule Catan. Put the num- number chits going A, B, C, D, E, F, G, spiraling. Do it properly. Do not, do not <laughs> just put them out randomly. It will ruin the game. Uh, the other option is, and that the people need to, to sort of think about or, or, or possibilities to include are combinations, right? So no, you can't have a million different gems in your game, but if you have 25 different gems in your game and the ability to mix and match between gems, so Mm -hmm. one gem does one thing, two gems do a different thing, the two other gems do another different thing, then when you get into those uh, combinations, the the combinatoric mathematics become... (laughs) uh ridiculous and so you can get vast numbers by using those combinations you know what that is a really good point because look at quacks of quedlinburg board games are doing this by using the same component for different things so the same component but all you got to do is switch out that recipe book and now it does something completely different which then leads me to another point look at the 8-bit box Here's Mm -hmm. a bunch of generic game components, and here's another set of rules, and each component is used for something different. And an extreme example would be Friedman Fries again, his 504, the the board game flip book where you pick a mechanic uh, and condition, and I don't even remember what the three things are, and combine those to play one of 504 unique games all with the same components. Right. So there's definitely some people out there doing some of this in interesting ways. And I got to say, I think that's possibly the best possible way is like Imhotep did the exact same thing, right? We're just going to throw in some new boards, but by mixing and matching them with the old ones, you're still using the same components. You're still using the same basic rules. We've now went to like Imhotep with the expansion. There's 10, 28 different ways, possible board company. Who's going to play Imhotep over a thousand times? So it's definitely there are people doing some good work with this and trying to mix things up with randomness. Yeah, even if your game is basic, understanding statistics and combinatorics yes. can be a vital aspect of making your game just that much fuller of an experience and able to stay on the table that much longer mm-hmm. in a in a one and done world. And I think a good one for publishers to think of is do you need a million different gem types? Like in a video game, it's kind of like why not? Plus, video games get played by millions of people, right? The mass market is way bigger. So you will want people to have different appearance. But if you can get your game up to 500 possible game states, heck, if you can get to 100 possible game (laughs) states, you're probably good. There aren't going to be a lot of people out there. There are games I own that I've played over 100 times. So that's, but like you get it to up to those number of game states, you probably don't need more randomization than that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it doesn't. Getting up to 128 doesn't take too many combinations. Like you can do that with very few cards. All right. My next one is something that video games can do. I'll just, yeah, sure. No problem. Is making changes to game components. Now, what this, the, the main thing that drove my thought on this one are the roguelikes, right? All of these games like Rogue Book, which we reviewed, check out a review, solid game. 
um, Splay the Spire and all of those, where it's a deck builder and you have your cards, but you can improve them. You can level up each of those cards, but not only that, you can level up multiple times and most importantly, in different ways. You can slot different things on them. How do you do that physically? Like, and, and keep track of your deck. Like Ascension tried it. It had a way where you could upgrade your cards, but you had to swap them for another card. So you basically had a big pile of cards sitting beside your board. And when you took the right action in the game, you had to look through it to find your card and swap. But that only, like, that's one iteration. That's one change from this card to that card. Now, Mystic Veil has taken some steps to recreate this. This is a game where you build your cards as playing. So you start off with basic cards that have one ability on them. And then you're going to use those to buy new card parts. And each card can have up to three parts and you literally slot them into a sleeve. So you make a new card, which is fantastic. But that is the only game that I think does anything like this. Yeah. And, and people, people might, might say, oh, well, why not use right on wipe up or use, uh, use dry erase? Well, unfortunately, if it's a card, odds are you're going to be shuffling or stacking mm. and friction and uh, dry erase don't go together well. True um one option is of course sleeving uh so you can have rather than a stack of other cards you can have a stack of sleeves that modify and you can have yep. set you know uh these are all my plus one uh st you know stat one sleeves and these are all my plus one stat two sleeves and you could you could do things that way but that's, See, that's still a little different a little mystic fiddling. veil has you sleeve multiple cards into one sleeve that's right. how they get away with it well, I mean, it's interesting. If, I don't think I've seen anyone do sleeves that have the data on them. The other option would be um, sleeves with a gloom style card, right? Yeah, See through. That's, that's what that's, Mystic, that's Veil Mystic is. Gray. Yeah. Uh, those are the two options that I think of because uh, you couldn't. The problem is you couldn't really do sleeve and sleeve well. Yeah, right. Because um, then so if you have need, a plus one and a plus two, you'd, you'd have to you'd have to have a different sleeve that would did plus one and plus two. So. That, interesting it gets it gets tricky um but yeah either the other you know either multiple cards in sleeves or different sleeves on, on top of cards are both valid options that you could uh certainly look at so there you go that's that maybe that's the new level up for the next level so whoever designed mystic veil are you listening that's your next step so that'll give you a fourth way to modify your cards as sleeves with stuff on <laughs> now moving away from cards games that have done this with dice so the first one I can think of is Rattlebones. Um, CGE? No, Rio Grande Games. Rio Grande Games has a patented plastic dice with pop-off cards. The most recent game to release under is Dice Realms, and man, does it look good. Though I don't want to sort all the stupid pieces when I start playing, which is another topic we'll get to in a minute. Um, that lets you actually modify your dice in the game, and I think that's fantastic. Now, what we need is the, the middle between the cards and that, like a way to modify your meeples or your a way to modify another randomizer or your resources. Like I just like like Mystic Veil scratches the surface on being able to do this. Rattle Bones, the, the role, one of the um, role for the Galaxy expansions also use those dice. Um, then there's is it Dice Throne or di I'm, what's the one with the cardboard chips on the dice? Oh, uh, Dice Throne's not the name. Dice something. Yeah, I know. I know what the one you mean, and I can't think of it. It's I play it on Board Game Arena. It's actually really solid. Where again, you're upgrading your dice. So, so there are some games doing it, but like compared to you know, I slot my boulder on top of this card, so now it does this. Or I guess an example with the meeples, Dice Forge. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, an example with the meeples would be the the tiny epic games have started to have things, but all they really are. Is, is they're using the tried and true mechanic that you have a card in front of you and there's a reminder on the table See, where, the, where you're slotting a sword into your meeple so everyone remembers you have a sword. Right. But it's not really modifying the meeple. Uh, I mean, you can modify your meeples. You, you can put, you know, you can do the, the not, I, you don't have to go as far as Lego, but you can go with, you know, the, a, hole in, a hole in each arm where you can slot a sword into the arm. Yeah, that's, and, what it, that's exactly what yeah. the Tiny Epic games do. Yeah. Tiny epic zombies, tiny epic epic realms. But again, that that again is just a physical representation of a card. It's 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 a way to tell you that hey, look, this meeple has something special. Well, and but I mean that's okay if you take it to the next level because what I think is important is doing something. And here we're gonna I'm gonna talk about Hellbringer, uh, which they did right on wipe off on your on your your mm -hmm. character really well. You know, you, you you make use of right on of of right on wipe off in places 
where you don't have to worry about the friction, right? right. Cards are not the right place, but the board might be player mm -hmm. boards. Uh, there are a lot of places on a game where right on wipe off uh, dry True. erase may be the right solution. And it's something that probably because of costs, uh, people haven't really experimented too much with. But I yeah. think it's worth looking at uh, in some cases. So here's an example of a game that tried. Sean got to try this. Yep. It was, uh, I don't know if I'd call it a success, but you had a character standee that had like all these slots on it and you would attach all these little chips and tokens to it to actually improve your game piece to show what armor you had, what item you were holding, what your hit points were, how many magic points you had, and whether you were elite or not. And I've got to say the concept isn't bad. The ability to look on the board and see everything that character had is a great idea. Now, it wasn't implemented that well because the things were almost unreadable and they were too tiny and you didn't know what the mouth they meant. Um, so you kind of had to pick up the piece anyway. But there was a game that tried. Absolutely. Now, I think I think the, the big problem that they had is they went with the old slot in slot solution. Yes. And while I understand why they did that, and I'm sure there were cost implications to doing it that way, and it kept components cheap, it wasn't, it turned out to be the best solution. Yeah. A better solution would be the plastic clips. And so you, you still oh, have to have standees. I've seen those, people hate those. I know. There's a reason people hate Betrayal but people House hate, on the Hill. But people hate standees. So the moment you, like, and you have to have a standee to do this, essentially, to do it, right? thoroughly enough because yes you can slot a couple of things in a meeple but you run out of space pretty quick whereas if you have a standee you can clip things on and there are ways other than plastic clips i mean you could go with uh um these things similar like this sort of you know some right. of the smaller the small versions of these uh these things come really really small yeah um yeah. yeah and that's even that's like a big one like you can get them really tiny uh and that is a fantastic solution to you know, clipping things onto a standee. The problem is people hate standees. Uh, so, uh, you know, maybe you go with the clear plastic standees. Maybe people like those better than the cardboard ones. I don't know. Yeah. But but standees are no, kind see, of right now the solution. Here's the actual level up. Instead of a meeple, you just get an action figure and you get all <laughs> the gear and stuff. Like you play, put an actual G.I. Joe out there and put the backpack on and put the helmet on and... Now we're getting into Warhammer territory because that's literally <laughs> the rules of right. Games Workshop games. WYSIWYG, your model has to be equipped as it is in the game, which is right. a rule I hated and one of the reasons <laughs> I stopped playing because um, I just want my models to look cool and they yep. can represent whatever they want. So there's a like so that is actually being done in the miniature game world. Fair. I am, and people have advanced that technology to be using rare earth magnets so they can swap stuff out. So actually, there's a space where the the war game industry the miniature war game industry is actually doing better than the tabletop game industry. although you're getting to a lot of cost there if you if you want to well, start yeah, putting 30 some dollars yeah. a figure nowadays right absolutely uh one another option that just sort of came to mind when i said you know the plastic standees uh use um i don't want to say shrinky dinks but the little plastic uh rubber you know plasticky yeah. sticky things you can oh color forms like color form color form onto, onto a plastic standee might be a solution. I don't necessarily go. know if it's a good solution. You I'm not recommending it, but it's stuff. something that might be worth experimenting with on a... Actually, uh, I, I'm kind of... I, I wish I almost wish this was a brunch. Um, when you get a chance, Google Chimera Station. So here is a worker placement game where you can actually modify your workers. And it's little plastic pieces where you give your alien new abilities like tentacles and cla crab claws and bigger brains so they can do more stuff. So that is a great example of a game that's pushing these limits. You literally upgrade your physical component, your your meeple, and it matters in game what right. you've done. So there's stackable meeples and there's different heads and different bodies yeah. and different legs and such. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only problem with that game is they snap together too good and I, I someone's got to be bleeding out there from it. Like I right. pinched myself twice during a, a demo game. Right. Plus, I do worry that after years, they may not, which who knows if you play the game for years, but they may not stick together so well. But based on how much they click together, <laughs> they clearly uh, planned for the long term. Yes. Yes, they are not easy. All right. So making changes to game components like permanent find a way so that I can it's basically tracking stuff on things that are going to get reused without having to replace them, I guess, is is kind of 
what this kind of boils down to. Right. All right. The next one I want to talk about is immersion, where you feel like you're in the game. You just don't tend to get that in tabletop games, right? Wait, we're both now playing Hades. I got why well, I got Sean hooked, but <laughs> multiple people have told him to play it. Like in that game, I feel like I'm Zagreus. I'm making decisions for as Zagreus, and I, I care about what happens to Zagreus. And yes, in role playing games, it happens. You can definitely feel like your character get immersed in your character. Some people taking it too far, even. Um, you can definitely get into it, but like you don't tend to get that at all in board games. Like even. When you're playing um, like dungeon crawl games where you play a single character, I don't usually ever feel like I'm that character. Like, I, I don't know what can be done to fix it. And then there's the whole video game flow state. Like, even if you're not playing an individual character, you're flying a spaceship or something else, or you get to this point where you forget you're playing a game, right? You don't remember that to jump on the Koopa, I have to hit the A button to jump. You just jump on the Koopa. Like it just happens. And then like I say, I've heard this called the flow state. And it like, is there a way to recreate this in a board game? Like, I don't think I've ever hit a flow state while playing a board game. I, I think, and this is, this is something I think you and I are probably just going to agree to disagree on. Uh, I'm kind of not interested in this. Um, okay. I, I, it, this one for me doesn't work. I don't want the soundtrack there. I don't want, to be pushed into the game. If the game, if sitting and playing the game as it is as it exists now, as as they exist today, isn't enough to get me into the game, um, I'm not really interested in in tricks and hacks and other things to to bring me into it any further. I want the theme and the mechanics to be able to do that or not. And it may not be a bad thing if they don't. Uh, I don't want to get into the, you know, Monopoly <laughs> mood if I'm yeah. playing. Uh, I do, you know, I don't want to uh, become a uh, complete jerk if I'm playing a take that game. Um, you know, it's again, but if I if I want to feel like a uh, like Indiana Jones when I'm playing uh, Arnak, maybe the game should be enough to do that because the th theme and the actions you're taking right. and the way you're thinking about what you have to do next in the game pushes you into that spot without a soundtrack or something else. Yeah, see, soundtracks are one way I could think of to get you more into the game. Evocative stories is another way to do it. Now, I was thinking about this, and I can think of one game that actually does this, which would be uh, Nyctophobia, where you are literally blindfolded and using your sense of touch to play the game, and you will have, like, literal jump scares and when someone says, you know, you found a rock and you just touch something physical and you're like, that's a rock, you definitely get that feel that I just found a rock. Now, you're not doing the physical action of picking up a, a, a rock, but that definitely happens. And then the other thing I was thinking about is these modern escape games yeah. definitely give you a bit of a feel of this when you're manipulating physical things. And the Chronicles of Crime series. Now, there's only one small part of that game. I got to admit, when I'm scanning a QR code, I don't feel like I went and <laughs> talked to someone. But there is a an aspect of that game where you put on a VR headset or you hold up your phone in AR mode. And sorry, it's not AR. But you hold up your phone and you look around a crime scene. Right. Now, it's cartoony. Like, actually, I haven't played. I've, the only one I've played, it's cartoony. Maybe in the um, modern crime ones, they're they're more photorealistic. But you're looking around a crime scene and literally moving your, you know, moving your phone and looking around and trying to find things. So I think that does give you some of that immersion that, that would be lacking. And I agree. I don't want to feel like a, a landlord in Monopoly. But <laughs> if I, I don't know if I'm playing a Jedi in Star Wars Imperial Assault to be kind of cool to feel like I could use the force in some way. I don't know exactly what that would be. Right. I guess, yeah, I guess it's sort of just sort of what you're looking for differently. Um, what's an, another one I was thinking of, uh, and it's completely escaped my mind now. Uh, hmm. Like there are some games like Hellbringer that have, you know, where you read off the story before you go in and do it. Uh, you know, we've had a few games like that where you, where you've, you know, they try to set the scene of the, the right. card battle you're going to go into. But there's a real disconnect between yeah. this emotional battle uh, battle scene and then playing out your decks of cards. <laughs> you know, yes. again, <laughs> yes. um, there, in some ways, it would actually be better to not to, to either not have that up front or have it at the end, like after you finished this card, and then you can sort of 
uh, retroactively think yeah. about what you've done and and place it into that world. I don't know. There, there is definitely a line between the story and theme and throwing it in the game and how to tie it together and that. But I, I don't know if that's a real how to make theme come out more in board games, I think might be a completely different topic. <laughs> Fair. Now, I did think of one other type of game where I think this does happen. Um, it's a type of game I don't like, though, is social deduction games. Like, yes, when you play werewolf, you don't feel like a werewolf. But if you're the werewolf, you definitely feel like the odd person out. And you are definitely trying to hide who you are and try to get away with as much as you can. Well, I think that, that is that definitely. That King Arthur game that you do love. Yes. That's <laughs> Shadows Over Camelot. Shadows over Camelot. Like, Camelot. You, you get into character, right? If you're a heroic knight, you feel the tension of the, the castles and we're going to lose. And if we don't defeat the Black Knight. So it's there. There, there is some immersion in some board games. I, I just I would like to see more of it. And Sean sounds like you would like to see less of it, depending, like only in the right game. And and then there's the 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 wrong way to do it, which is we've talked about multiple times, Battlestar Galactica. But we don't need to retell that story here. Yeah. So it, but <laughs> sometimes it can go wrong. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That that's more about role playing in games and when you shouldn't shouldn't. Yeah. Actually, I saw Solon today was complaining that people were playing a dungeon crawling board game in his store and spending way too much time role playing. <laughs> and, and he's like, why are these people spending all this time role playing in a dungeon crawling board game? And I just replied because with that's because they're awesome. Because <laughs> to me, that's what makes those games so much more fun. Fair enough. All right, I'm going to move on to the next one, which is in general, I, I not counting downloading patches or anything like that. Uh, in general, video games have no setup and takedown time. And to me, this is the thing it draws people to play video games versus tabletop a lot of the time. You just sit down and start playing. Honestly, I have sat here and went, I could go try Rust Ruins Arnak solo downstairs before I review tonight, or I could just boot up a computer game and just start playing right now, or I could go do another run in Hades. Now, this is one there's not a lot tabletop games can do, right? They're physical games that require physical presence and set up and tear down. There are things that help. Um, box inserts are, we had an entire discussion way back in our first year of the show about our box inserts worth it. And our end result was if it helps get the game to the table more often then it's worth it. Yeah. And this, this really depends on the insert, some inserts and some sets make a huge difference and really make things vastly easier to set up. You hand out a, a few boxes to people, you put mm -hmm. out the, the board and a couple of boxes on the board and you're ready to play. Uh, yeah. versus what happens with most games is you have to sort components this, out sort of this it. and dump this and sort this out here. And you've got a bag of stuff you need to sort through and, and, and so shuffle these and do this and do that. Shuffling is one huge thing. And, and actually this actually goes back a little bit to the randomization problem. If you get a fresh deck in a video game, it's randomized, assuming that the programmer mm -hmm. isn't an idiot. If you shuffle, <laughs> if you shuffle a deck of cards, odds are really good. Unless you know what you're doing, it's not random. Yeah. Yeah, they say seven riffle shuffles, but again, you have to riffle shuffle properly. So yep. <laughs> that's a whole thing. Yeah. How components are organized, though, is something can happen. Now, one of the things I do like, and this is where publishers can help with this, is start including these box inserts in your games. Don't just pack your game so that the components get to the customer in good shape. Yes, I realize that is the main goal with most existing box inserts. They're not organizers. They're inserts to make sure nothing gets damaged. But take that next step. Go and provide some type of organization. Okay. Um, we just opened up side. I don't know why there's only two, but it comes with these two nice little plastic containers for holding your resources. There's four types of resources. I don't know why I only get two containers, but you use the bottoms and the tops, and I guess it works. It's a little confusing, It's a, but but that's a little thing they can do. Um, miniatures coming in plastic trays that they can go back into, which not only prevent the miniatures, but also make it easier. But again, Scythe comes with one of these. I would have loved it if that was four separate or five separate ones. So, so I could be assuming. like, here's yours, here's yours, here's yours, here's yours, right? It's a little thing. There are other things you can do too, like make every resource a different shape in brightly defined colors to make them easier to sort. You still got to sort them, but it's just quicker to grab all the red, brown, whatever. Plus, you're going to help the game make your game more accessible, which is a big thing as well. Um, make your cards clearly different decks. Like, I hate this. When you get a game 
where the only difference on the back of the cards is a small Roman numeral one, two, three, and it tells you to sort the decks into one, two, three and shuffle them and then restack them. Make them bright colors. Make one orange, the next one brown, and the other one chartreuse. And then I, I can easily tell them where to where how to sort them, right? That's another thing you can do. Another thing is what do you do with stuff when done with it? Far too many games are just like remove from the game. Well, if it said like remove from the game and put into this box, that way it's there. Next time you go to set up, it's already in the box you need it in or even having a spot to discard cards. Yeah. Because many games just say discard, but there's no spot on the board to discard them. So then you end up with one discard pile. Sometimes you end up with four. I played games of Terraforming Mars where it seemed like every player had their own discard in front of them or every pair of players. And at the end of the game, you got to gather them all together. And then if you have multiple decks, again, uh, say you've got technology cards and you got resource cards and you've got spending cards and they all end up in your same hand. Well, people, when they tend to discard, just throw them in the same pile. Have a spot with three different discards. So at the end of the game, I don't have to sort through all the cards. Yeah, no, it's, it's there's so many little things that can be done. And the problem, of course, we run into is cost. Uh, every piece of material that goes into a box ups the cost. And we're already at a point where cost is a problem in the hobby game industry. Um, and I mean, it, to be fair, it is also in the video game industry. Steam is a perfect example where there are a lot of people out there who don't buy full price games anymore uh, yeah. because they know that the Steam summer sale is going to come around mm -hmm. or whatever is going to happen and there will be a discount. Uh, and reviews are getting to the point on Steam. You will see a lot of times where it's like, I think this game is worth it at a 40% discount. <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, that, that sort of things happen. And we are moving that way in the board game world as well. Uh, yeah. Because frankly, it's a elite hobby. Uh, it is an expensive hobby, even as it is right now, before you start looking at all these other yeah. options. But I will admit, as someone who buys these games, I would be willing to pay more for a game. I will get to the table more often because it's easier to set up and take down. Yep. Like, I don't want to have to go to a third party. I don't want to have to go to Etsy. I don't want to have to go to Meeple Realty. I don't want to have to go to Folded Space and buy a third party insert. I want to be able to, like maybe just companies need to contact these other companies and sell them in bundles. And if you want it, you get it. And yep. give me like, you know, if you buy it bundled together, you get a discount. Like there's got to be a better way to get that functionality in the box when I get it without having to make me go shop and look for something third party. Like I, lots of other companies have learned this. Yep. Now, another one, we've talked about this many, many times that is an important part about this. Give me a separate sheet that shows me how to set up everything. Give me reference cards. Give me how to plays. Give me walkthroughs. Give me all that too. So I can teach the game better. So we can quickly set it up. Give me a nice thing that's just like a big size of the box picture of the game setup so I can put it on the table while I'm passing everything out for people to shuffle. They can look to see where it goes. Those aren't huge costs. In many cases, they may even be free because they can be included in your card count. Why? Why is it that I need to go to the esoteric order of gamers exactly. every time in order to get these? Why? <laughs> you know, we've, we've gotten to the point now where some of our great content creators that we know and love on Twitch uh, like Paul are getting called up to create content for board games, right? Man, you know, writing manuals or writing online mm -hmm. tutorials for things. Why aren't companies going to the esoteric order of gamers and saying, "Can you make us a, uh, you know, a help a guide to help play this game or something?" Because mm -hmm. why are again why are we re relying on third parties to do a first party job? No offense, Paul and Rodney, and you know, we're not trying to put you out of business. That's that's not our goal. Oh, here. no, I, I, we still want them. That's great. Yes. But we also want this instant setup. You know, we want the yes. quick setup. We want the we want the reference because you still need to learn the game. We still need mm -hmm. the Rodneys and the Pauls. Uh, but we also want something in the box that will help us even after yes. we've learned the game. Uh, no, you know, I, I you don't have to you don't have to learn arnak again uh, arnak's a bad example there's a lot of games where you don't have to learn the game but 
you still need to crack the manual to set it up every mm-hmm. single time. Like how many of those games are there where, yeah, no, oh, I know yeah. how to play this game. I can set up, I can, but every I got to get builder, it on the, on what's the, the hand size. Yeah. Every deck builder. What's my hand size. Do I shuffle when I'm out of cards or when I go to draw those two questions should be a card <laughs> in every deck builder that t- answers those questions right. on, on a board. Like, you know, every time every time there are cards board, when they're something. played, do they go to a play area or a discard? Yeah. Are they immediately discarded or at the end of my turn? Like there's just certain things that I always have to look up because every game handles them a little bit differently. Uh, and that's and this is even the easy games. It this it, this is, should be a no brainer when you get to more complex games yeah. like um, Anachrony. I mean, my God, the different number of setups available in that game, yet there's a different book for every setup. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna move to the next one because this is going longer than I thought it would. MMO multiplayer online. This one's funny. The, the This probably wouldn't even been on my list because I would have never even considered it as a possibility. But with COVID and many people around the world being locked home and not able to get together with their game group, this has gotten better. There are many publishers now who have released rules variants for playing their games over Zoom or some other chat program. There are Zoomable game lists out there now. Now, it's so far, I've yet to open a game. And it have right in the box telling me how to play it online right away. But it's definitely becoming a go on their website, check the PDF, get the how to play it online ability. So I am now seeing companies offering multiplayer online games where Sean and I could get together and physically play side together. I don't know if size is one that's zoomable, (laughs) to be honest, off the top of my head. Uh, now, I mean, there are other solutions. There are third party, again, third party solutions like Vorpal Board, uh, which I've never used and I have questions about, but it's out there and it has, it does have some support. Um, uh, so now, I there are, of course, uh, like at Board Game Arena, right? Tabletop Simulator, Tabletopia. That's not what I mean. I, I want to sit down and have the physical components to be able to play, right? So we set up Gloomhaven somehow. And Sean can play with, with Gloomhaven set up here, me, Tori, Cat, and D, and Sean, well, you can't play Gloomhaven five player, whatever, bad example. <laughs> and Sean is up there on a laptop and is able to take part and play. Like, I'm, I'm not talking about, again, once you get into digital games, you're getting into stuff that video games already are good at, like tracking points and doing math for you and handling shuffling of decks and that, right? By that point, I'm like, you're, you're now doing that overlap. That Venn diagram is now overlapped and we're getting into that blurry spot where is it a board game? Is it a video game? I'm talking about being able to play a physical board game with someone not in the same physical space. Yeah, no. And that's again, you know, Vorpal board is designed for that. I'm sure there are other solutions out there. I just have had that one yeah. thrown at me a, a number of times. Uh, but again, all it really is, is a, a way somewhere to put your cards and, a, and camera. It's, it's basically a fancy sort of, um, you know, zoom, <laughs> zoom right. client, uh, designed for board games. Uh, you know, Roger says it would be cool if you could buy part of a larger game you could play online. Uh, like, and, and that's and that would actually be really interesting is if you could buy, uh, you know, parts of Gloomhaven. So you didn't have to buy all of Gloomhaven. You bought you, you know, buy these... the deck for your character. Exactly. I could buy my part of Gloomhaven that I needed as a remote player uh, and we could play that. That would definitely be a viable solution for some games. Um. That's or, an interesting way. Yeah, like any of those deck builders, right? Yeah. Like if God, hmm, even deck builder, like uh, uh, again, if you share. have variant rules, if you had your own copy of Ascension, I have mine. Yes, there's a chance we'll both get the same card, which normally wouldn't happen. Right. But the ability to play would probably outdo that. Yeah. Outweigh that. So now what Roger's question first made me think, and I read it wrong because I didn't see buy, was what I have seen now is games where you play you then go online and put in the results and that affects something whether it's a virtual game world just an online scoreboard or something of that aspect um i'm going to spoil something here charterstone has this there is an aspect of charterstone where you are going to get a world map and see where your board is in the world and you can compare it to other people's boards and see a growing kingdom 
of everyone who's ever played Charterstone. And I'm like, that is fantastic. That is just really neat. And it's one of the main reasons I want to play again <laughs> so that we can rank better <laughs> for her kingdom. Right. Uh, another example of that would be D&D Organized Play. Um, I don't know if they do much with Adventure, uh, what's it called now, Adventure League now? But it used to be that in Living Forgotten Realms, you logged every game and depending and, and would put in like the results and they would change the game world. Now, what they would do is take the average, like, you know, if the average group didn't defeat this red dragon, well, suddenly that red dragon goes on a rampage. Right. And I thought that was really cool. And I would like to see more of that. But that re requires a company like Hasbro, right? Like that requires, you know, Stonemeyer Games to, well, Stonemeyer's a bad example too. Whatever, mom and pop game shop to somehow have a web developer that can write an MMO to go with all their games. But I think it'd be really cool to see more, um, what would you call it? Shared experience, right? Where yeah. where you play the game over there, I play it here, and somehow my game could affect yours. Yeah, no, that would be interesting. And I, I just did a quick look, and it doesn't look like Adventure League is quite the same as it used to be. They're, yeah, they're... I don't, I don't know. Like, I think they have big events, right? Like at D and D Expo, there might be like a tournament game where the the outcome of that tournament game might affect the storyline. Right. Uh, just like Games Workshop did, right? When they destroyed the Warhammer World, Games right. Workshop did this, where they had you fight the end times battle. The the actual war versus chaos happened, and they promised everyone that if chaos won. We're going to scrap the game and chaos won and they eliminated the game. You cannot play Warhammer fantasy battle that Sean and I grew up playing. The game is dead. Um, there were rumors it was coming back. I don't know if that ever happened, but for a number of years, you're stuck with age of Sigmar and it's your own fault for not defeating <laughs> chaos. People come on. There we go. Now, Ryan makes a point to go back to, to, to what we were talking about too, is who really would rather play with physical components with distance when there's virtual tabletops. I would. Yeah, I generally speaking, I would much yeah. rather if I if I could set up, you know, Star Realms in front of me right now and play Sean online, I'd rather do that than play Board Game Arena. There are absolutely 100% benefits to physical play uh that just there's a there's a tactile aspect to board games that you do not get on BGA. There are some Board Game Arena games where yeah, it's fine, you know. Sure, you're yeah. just rolling two dice and and moving a, moving something around, it doesn't matter. But there's definitely a tactile aspect to cards and the way you're holding cards and seeing cards that makes a big difference mm -hmm. in in a lot of games. Um, and the game we're going to be reviewing tonight is actually yeah, one of example. them where it, mm -hmm. it, uh, it makes a big difference whether you're playing online or not or whether you have played in person or not. Yeah, another example with role-playing games. I tried running a game online. I have no interest in doing that again. Like I may do it just because some people have asked me to do it, but like I I want to play in person. Where well, like even if we even if I ran one, I would probably do what we did last and not have a virtual tabletop again, unless like Sean runs it in the background and I don't have to worry about it. I'm like I have enough to worry about. I don't want to worry about all this technology in the background. <laughs> Give me my DM screen and my dice and my adventure. All right, last one because <laughs> we've been talking about this for a while. Iteration. Okay, so this is something. The, the reason video games stay so popular, especially the stupid um, micro app, microtransaction apps, is small progressive changes to the game based on what you've done. Now, legacy games do some of this, right? But legacy games generally require the same group of players and a large time commitment and then to have a long campaign. What I'm talking more about here is something in, say, Azul, which, you know, once you scored 80 points in Azul, you now unlock a new tile color. Like think about how much harder Azul would get if there was now another color in there, right? Something like that, right? Just a little, video games do this a lot, right? They, they give you little tiny additions. You need to move your mouse. Thank you. <laughs> your mouse cursor is putting words on, is it mine? No, it's because it's not mine. I don't know. Anyway, I'll, I, I can't read because it says in big letters, anonymous platypus. Oh, weird. So I'm like, I can't read what <laughs> it's saying. All right. Sorry. <laughs> um, so video games add in a lot of this to keep you playing, right? As well as a reward. And to, 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 to reiterate, like it just gets a little bit harder, whatever. There's a little bit more monsters next time. There's You get an additional card in your deck, whatever. Just small incremental changes to keep the game interesting. 
I would love to see some of that on the tabletop. That's not, like I said, a big, like, I don't know, a legacy game you can play a hundred times, maybe where like every time you just add a new card, like every time you play clank, you throw one new card in the deck, your deck eventually is just this new thing. That's going to be there going forward. Now, Draconis did that. Uh, that's one of the best examples I can think of is the Wrath expansion for Draconis that just slowly added new things in over 13 games that wasn't, you know, the next game at Charterstone. Like right. it, it was it was small increments. I would like to see more of that. Yeah, and it's hard to do. Like, I mean, you look at something like uh, DC Deck Builder where, yeah, you can add in a new expansion, but that's, a, a you know, a reasonably big change. Yeah, it's a and big chunk. to do... You know, you need to you need to sort of reshuffle things, and there it's actually big enough that they expect you to take out a chunk of the base cards in order to mm -hmm. make sure you, uh, you know, it, it balances out. Um, it's hard to say how to do that. I mean, maybe it could be as simple as you know, again, if it if it's a card based game, uh, the publisher starts putting out booster packs you can pick up every once in a while as stuff you can add in uh at yeah, certain points honestly, maybe or... maybe that's the living card game format really yeah. is is we're gonna put out a new pack of cards every month and you get to add those into your game so i th i think it's being done at just for me it's always a bit it always feels like like you're changing the game whereas i don't i want the same game with just i don't know a right. little you, bit more well you want i mean essentially what you're talking about is small expansion packs uh promo cards um you know hey in this you know a promo card like, where you only add a game where it's like don't open like like make every game a legacy game i guess right I guess, like yeah. like don't include these cards until you've unlocked put achievements in there i didn't even think of achievements achievements is a whole thing but that's, I mean, that's kind of a different topic. i would like to even see like with azul this could be it's it's something where you know it's not there at the start it all you only add the extra color yeah. if someone Once... that game gets 80 points and then the next game it's gone again um yeah but then you got to play multiple games to throw the color in like you'd, you'd have to be set up i would just someone unlocked it so in a way unlockables and achievements is maybe more what i'm looking for mm. so playing scythe which i'll be talking about later tonight one of the things it included which it didn't mention in the rule book is there was a sheet of achievements and the first player to achieve each of these things is supposed to write their name down on the day to happen i'm like that's just cool having that in there kind of gives you something to do and, and on it was an achievement that i was like that's a thing you can do that. And then the next time I played, I had to figure out how to do that. Right. And I discovered a new aspect of the game from it. Um, Viticulture did this, the, the original Viticulture in Tuscany. And I have no idea if the essentials do this. So the original Viticulture was a full game. You played it, it was a solid game. Well, Tuscany had 13 or so different little modules. And what it was, was the next player to win a game of Viticulture picks one of those modules. It's now in the game from now on. Then whoever wins that game picks another module and then throws it in. And then every game going on has that module and so on. And eventually you would unlock all of Tuscany. And honestly, I never unlocked all of Tuscany, but I thought that was really cool. Was just this, this slow progress. And again, it goes with the onboarding, right? It's a slow addition of more stuff to the game. Well, I, I actually like that idea from side uh, of, of achievements where you're not necessarily, necessarily adding anything into the game no but by aiming for achievements there are new things about the game you can learn it's yes. like oh how do i get the you know flaming ball of wax achievement oh well there's this thing over here that i've never really explored mm -hmm. i bet you if i go up there i can get it and that just makes the game different because you're yeah. forced into trying different things and like, it's not going to work the... in azul but in a bigger game like size even azul Win a game without having five of a single color. There's an achievement for Azul. Like you can, and now we might, there, here's our new thing we can start <laughs> working on. I can start making board game achievements for various okay. different board games. Hey, do you listening? This might be a thing. <laughs> that, that could be like a free newsletter packs. downloadable thing. Yep. No, seriously, I, I, we could do some cool stuff. With no, like for example, the one I saw was win a game without building any mechs. And I was like, how the heck do you win a game aside without building mechs? Is that even possible? Well, it must be, because here it is on this achievement sheet. So I went, that's it. I'm going to see. And I didn't. I built Max. Like, I, I'm like, I don't know the game well enough to try to win without building Max. <laughs> I have no idea. Plus, plus we decided at this point, we're like, I'm not filling in the achievement sheet. But the next time we sit down to play seriously without any alcohol involved with the full group, we're going to be like, hey, this is a thing. And I think we should start filling it out because I think it'll be cool. And we'll introduce it. But I actually sat down and was like, all right, how could you do this? And, and while I'm playing, I'm like, there's got to be a way. 
got to be a way. And I discovered the way. And I'm like, how did I even miss that? Like, it's obvious once you realize what it is. Yeah. I don't know. I, achievements and iteration. I, I just would like to see more of it. Like, I think this is why I like legacy games, because that's what you get. Right. Like, like Charterstone, except again, Charterstone hit that game three and it was like, Bleh. I'm like, I, I want a slower yeah, a progression. Little, little like, more, a little more dribble and less. A little uh, more less, dribble. Less um, again, these feed them and freeze, these fast forward games. Uh, one of them is called something fruit, I think it's called. And it's like that. You you play the game and you play it with like five fruit and play. And then when you play game two, you now have six fruit and play. When you play game three, you remove a pretty basic fruit and replace it by another one. Um, an example of that, you could do that with Sushi Go. Take like Sushi Go or Sushi Go Party is probably a better example. And put in like five really basic fruit, right? Or sushi, sorry, really basic sushi that like whatever, collect a set, collect a run. Well, put in the ones pairs. from the original set. Yeah. 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 If you and play then, sushi, and then once you finish party. a game, you swap one of those out for a new one. Right. Now you're getting your iteration, you're getting your onboarding all in one. And you're getting possibly your easier setup because it tell you to do that at the end of the game. Before you put it away, take this away, take this away, and shuffle. There. You just made it so the next time you play, you just sit down and play. There you go. All right. We've been going on, so we have. So I think that's going to be it for tonight's talk about things we would love to see ported over from video games into more tabletop games. Now remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions every week. If you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. And now it's time to check in with the lobby and see our chat room here on Twitch to see if anyone here has anything to add to this discussion. All right, lobbyists, do you have anything to add? What video game elements would you like to see more of at the table? All right, I know you weren't getting all these, so I don't know if we have them all, but I know there's some good stuff in here. I, I wasn't hearing it, but I was. I saw stuff coming coming through. There's been a lot. Um, Sorry, bad radio as we <laughs> scroll through our feed. So I know Darkling Blight was talking about uh, game apps and long-term support and essential, so, essential stuff, which is what we've talked about a lot of times. And... Yeah, that's see, they, yeah, just noting that what they are worried about with game apps is the app stop working, which is yeah. definitely a concern. I, I I just don't think that there's so much we could talk about with that. Like that could be well, a whole topic have. in a we way. We did a whole episode, like we've that. mentioned. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, we did a long time ago, but it's it, times have changed. Um. I, I personally, I'm I'm more in favor of apps than I used to be. Uh, so Darkling Blight mentions Seventh Continent has a save filter built in. You can save at any time. Owns it, but hasn't played it much. I have heard such good things about that game, and people have recommended it very strongly to me. Uh, but I have not played it. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, the Ryan is, is talking about you know that virtual <laughs> tabletop. I it's for me. Sorry, for me, virtual tabletops just don't do it. I, you know, given the choice between there, there's three options, right? You can play in person, you can play or four, right? play in person, play on Zoom, play on board game arena, something designed to play that board game, or you can play on tabletop simulator. I would say there's five because then there's also digital versions of games like Steam, Terraforming Mars is very different than board game arena. Yeah, fair. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and I think to me, I'm going to play either a digital version, whether it's either the BGA or the Steam, or I'm going to play in person. Uh, and if I have to, if there's no other choice, I'll play Tabletop Simulator, but I find it a poor experience. Now, yeah. maybe in a, a VR world, it would be better, maybe, maybe. but uh, it just, it's so clumsy. I, I have, you know, I have just found maybe, and, and maybe I'm just an old white guy, <laughs> But I, I don't find it easy to work. And I've used a couple of different ones. Um, and yes, there are some, you know, keystrokes and things to, to, to make things easier. But it's just it just doesn't feel natural. Um, right. and, and, it, and that takes away from the game because you're focusing on the system around the game. You're not able to focus on the game system itself. And I think Deanna would agree with you. She really fights with Tabletop yep. Simulator. Yeah. Uh, so Roger point out Wingspan has an introduction demo, a special deck of starter cards. Uh, another example of that is Race for the Galaxy does that. There are a set of numbered cards in that game that you are meant to hand players as their starting cards. And if you wish, there's a walkthrough that shows you playing the first four of those cards. 
Now, as you're playing it, you're going to get more cards in your hand, and there's no reason not to just keep playing that game and finish it. Which leads to the other thing is you could also, after you've done that, stop and start over if you really didn't like being told what to do for your first four cards. Right. So, yeah, Wingspan has a demo built in that we were talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, again, uh, Darkling Blight did bring up Mystic Veil's customizable cards as being able to modify items in video games, which he was just a little ahead of us. That was before we got to talk about customizing things. Um Roger was suggesting having a hand of cards being able to level up, so possibly having multiple hands of cards. I got to say that sounds like too much work and confusing. Um, again, you could do any card game by just having multiple copies. If I have a copy of every card this card can turn into, I can swap it out. But just the, the physicality of even having to find those cards or sort them, let alone the cost of putting that many cards in a game. Yeah. Uh, so Ryan's talking about Minis game years back where you built up the accessories as you play. I'm not remembering that off the top of my head, um, but I will point out the campaign-ish Warhammer games. So, for example, More Time, where you play your game and you get to keep whatever you found and then your squad levels up and like everyone who was killed, you roll on a damage table and most of them are going to be fine, but some might be like missing an arm and then your stat change. So you did get that iteration through that style of game. Like Mordheim is probably a really good example of a board game that iterates. Same with a, a Blood Bowl uh, league. Playing through a Blood Bowl league, you get that iteration. You get the, you're going to roll, and every game's going to be different because of the rules for Nuffle at the beginning of the game. And your players get hurt, and they roll on a table to see what happens to them. Blood, miniature games definitely do seem to be better at some of these things than board games are even. Absolutely. I mean, Blood Bowl, you've got the whole team progression and, you know, you level up your team and you can can, can get new cheerleaders and, and your ref, your coaches level up and your assistant yeah. coaches and your your uh, apothecaries. Um, you know, it, Blood Bowl is a legacy miniature game, <laughs> essentially. I, well, yeah, it's a it's, it's campaign uh, game. I don't even know what you call them at that point. Uh, Ryan mentions Role Player Adventures has a keyword driven branching narrative. That could facilitate immersion. That does sound cool. I haven't played role player adventures. Unfortunately, I haven't kept up on the role player games. That's because Tim Verling keeps promising me I'll get to, together, but we need to meet up physically. And three years now, <laughs> maybe next year, we'll work with Thunderworks games a little closer. Shipping to Canada stinks, as I learned again yesterday. Yep. Uh, now, Ryan is saying virtual tabletops are a happy medium for distance play and i do agree like like it's awesome that it's out there Absolutely. we had some great space-based games on tabletop simulator and it's been a godsend for during covid times but i'd still rather play physically i mean it allowed us to uh get me enough plays of uh the roller coaster game whereas i wouldn't have yeah, been able to and unfair physically both. play fun fair and unfair without the tabletop simulator existence out there but if an unfair uh module showed up on board game arena tomorrow i would never again play it on tabletop simulator Mm -hmm. ever um even if it was a bad implementation on board game arena i still probably wouldn't ever play it on on uh on tabletop simulator because it's just you know if you're gonna play it digitally i want the benefits of a game where you don't have to worry about setup and you don't have to worry about scorekeeping and all that stuff Whereas, I don't want to have to hit R to shuffle the cards. And, right. You've and got you've got all the, the negatives, around. all the negatives of a physical game, uh, but it's in digital format with none of the benefits of the of the digital mm. format. And that's a frustration for me personally uh, on the tabletop simulator. So tech says I have a few games with game trays inserts and it makes it so much easier for setup and takedown. Again, game trays in particular seem to be very good at the we're going to give you trays that are functional, not just for storing your game. Well, I mean, the infinity box is a great example yes. of, you know, and it took yeah, us and forever. Everyone, yeah. It took us forever to put it all together. But once it was done, mm-hmm. it's like, here, here you go. Oh, you want to play yellow? Sure. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. Yeah. And, and Eclipse and, Second Dawn for the Galaxy is another. Yep. Yep. There's there's a few of those out there where uh, it's all Rogers just... calls out Wasteland Express delivery service. Yep. There's a good one. Yep. Uh, Ryan says, if there is or will be expansions, please accommodate that in the base box insert. That one's rough. Like, it is. honestly, companies don't know. Like, they don't know how well their game's going to do. So do you pay the additional cost to leave room for the expansion and the game flops? 
that might have done better if it was cheaper and had a smaller footprint. Like that, that one's rough. I, I got to say, I hated it at first, but I actually don't mind the big box trend. And I mean, you look at a problem, you look at something like, again, a DC, uh, DC deck builder, uh, you know, the first box was of a size where you could get a couple more things in there, but they just kept putting out so many expansions. If they'd made the original box big enough for all the expansions, people would have been furious because you would have gotten this giant empty box. Mm hmm. Yeah, that, that one's a rough one. And, and I don't envy publishers having to make that choice. Right. So as an example, Stonemeyer right now has put up a survey. Anyone who plays Stonemeyer games might want to look at this. Asking, he said, I have no intention of making a tapestry big box. No, everything does not fit in the box, but it's big enough already. But if I'm wrong and you want one, please go on this survey because if enough people want it, I'll make it. Yeah. I like and one of the I think I think the the better solution to me that's working is uh what DC deck building did, what Space Base did is we're gonna put out an expansion box that has a little bit of extra. We're gonna give you some mm -hmm. value in it, but its main purpose is now that we have a bunch of content, now we're gonna let allow you to put it all together. And you don't have yeah. to buy it. If you've only got the base game, you're good. You don't need anything else. But if you are following along with our game and you are building up all this extra content, here have something else that will now hold yeah. it all and that's what dc did that's what space space did and i'm sure there's others i haven't run into that have done that as well but those are those are the two that come to mind uh and it's it's sort of a nice balanced solution right uh you are paying for it extra for it but they mm -hmm. all they usually throw something else in there like there's you know with the multiverse box for dc you got mom multiverse expansion as well uh as a lot of empty space that you could fill up with all your other cards See, what I would rather see, and I've only ever seen it once, and it was for Core Worlds from Stronghold Games, and I think this is actually the perfect balance, is the expansion comes in a box big enough to fit the expansion in the base game. And then if you put out another expansion, it comes in another new box that's big enough to fit all of it, which then, I think is better. You're getting the expansion anyway. You're going to have to store it somewhere. Why not have it come in that bigger box? But I get, I mean, what if you only buy the third expansion? Then you've got, you know, it's... Uh, well, it depends on the game and if the expansions yeah. require the previous ones. Most do. Yeah, Quite suppose. a few games do require you to have the previous expansions. Right. Like, that was a game where the expansions were planned right from the start. And Stephen Bonacore made the decision, I want the core game to be small, to take up this much space so people see it and think deck builder. Because deck builders tended to come in a certain shape box that looks like a card box. Right. The expansion is your standard Kallax box right? Your standard board game Kallax box, and now both fit in there great. Like, actually, it, it came with a molded insert and all this stuff that wasn't in the original. I'm way happier about that instead of having to go spend $60 on a big box with a couple new cards in it. Yeah. Although, again, it depends It depends on the type, right? Again, with yeah. with uh, with with DC, you know, you get your, your core set has, say, 200 cards in it, whereas your expansions usually have, like, 50 cards in them. So yeah. it's it's kind of, you know building up and, and they're very much a mix and match where you don't need mm -hmm. to have all of them. Now, Ryan points out he having to throw plastic inserts away because they're functionally useless. Part of the purchase price included that insert. Again, it's in there to protect the stuff. You'd be even more mad if you spent less money, but got a damaged game. Yep. If all your cardboard tokens were pent and your rule book had a fold in it. Like again, I don't envy publishers having to make those decisions, but nope. People get so upset about the fancy flight inserts, but they're not there to organize your game. They're there so it gets to you undamaged. Yeah. Which and is mean, fair. Again, but, remember these games are getting, you know, made and assembled in China, shipped across the world in a boat, thrown onto a truck, thrown into a warehouse, picked up by a forklift, put onto another truck, sent yeah. to your board game, sent to your your store where some clumsy guy in the back is going to stock the shelves and then it's going to go to you and then it's going to get you know thrown in your back seat because you know you, you got to get out get home and then finally you're going to open that box and you need it to have survived yeah all those stages between Plus, board gamers are obsessive about the box like like people get upset if there's a little dent in the box let alone the components inside well i just saw someone someone today was unboxing a copy of descent and as they took their plastic wrap off, it tore the side of the box off. <laughs> okay. Um, and, Odd. and, and it was, you know, 
they're horrified. I mean, and you, people are crying in their comments because yeah. here you've got his box of descent with a torn box. <laughs> now, yeah, Deanna does agree with Ryan. If your insert sucks and I need to toss it to find my own way to store the game, I paid for that uselessness. Now, I'll admit where I get upset is when you can tell it was meant to hold this stuff and does a bad job of it. Right. I, and I think that's, again, publishers trying to compromise, right? They want the game to get to you, but everyone complains about the useless insert. So we're going to try to do something. Yeah, and like you get some of those ones where the miniature is held in there, but it like the sword is bent because it doesn't actually hold all all the miniature. Yeah, you see that quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what cards that level up. Dan is talking about cards that level up. I don't know. I was scrolled up, so I didn't see it when it happened. Oh, I missed. uh, Oh, uh, some game that sounds super familiar. Cards that level up. I don't know. They said that one of the Ascension expansions had that. Yeah. But there's a reason a lot of people prefer to play Ascension on the app. Well, the fact that you don't have to shuffle a thousand and twenty cards is yep, the that main too. reason. Uh they have Ryan saying the his impression of tabletop simulator is like playing games with salad tongs. Yeah, yeah. pretty close. Eight boxes of air. See, that's another thing, right? Shelf room is limited. See, that's the other thing we haven't even talked about is another big part of marketing games is shelf presence right. at the store, not on your shelf. Right. You can have the greatest game in the world, but if it's in a tuck box and it's next to Gloomhaven, Splendor. which one are you going to look at? <laughs> Splendor. You could fit Splendor in a box this big. No one will buy it at that price. Yeah. At, at, well, no one will pay the price of the chips because it's got those nice chips. Yeah, no, that's a that's a huge, a huge issue. Uh, and we're at a point now where, you know, you've got to have that Kallax size, box size to to make a presence. And uh... yeah, now nowadays, and people look for that size, right? Yep. There, there's definitely a look. Yeah, OK, Ryan does make a good point about new additions. So, yes, uh, will there be expansions or not? So, you know what? I, I wonder how people would react if the new edition in game came in a different size box. I don't think I've seen it done right. where like the new printing is in now this giant box that fits the expansion. Well, I mean, unless, uh, unless it's a, a, a Kickstarter edition where you're, you know, the new box, the new second edition ha- has a Kickstarter box that has all the expansions in it. Yeah, there is that. So Ryan was specifically talking about plastic inserts. He's not complaining about cardboard trench inserts of tech stuff. Why give me plastic? If you're paying for plastic plus an environmental aspect, right? If you're oh, just yeah. tossing that out, there's a whole, don't need more microplastics. Yeah, don't ask for the shiny bits on your boxes either. Uh, All right. I, I think that is the longest topic discussion we've had this year. <laughs> yep. I think we're going to move over to the coffee break because this has been empty for a long time. Yeah. 